We're live, pal, back with Andrew Zarian, myself, Double G. We're going to talk about some wrestling here like usual, but I wanted to mention this is a little bit of a, of a tease for next week. Now, contracts haven't been signed yet. Fees have been negotiated, but I think we're going to get Big Dave Meltzer on next week to do a super chat Q&A. Andrew, if you had the opportunity yeah. to ask Big Dave a question, and you cannot ask if there was more than one Ultimate Warrior. Which which question would you ask? Ah, uh, crap! I was going to ask him that one. <laughs> uh, first of all, the reason why the contract's not signed is that we are having a big issue with Dave because we put in the contract that he has to be in a tank top, <laughs> yeah. showing the guns. <laughs> sure, like one yeah, of those he's... old school, like the the spaghetti uh, the spaghetti strap gold gym ones. Like one oh, of those. He's, he's got them. I've seen them. He's got. You've seen them. Oh. I'm so jealous. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm gonna think about it. There has to be a question. You know what? I, I got one, but it's such like a marky answer, right? Well, what is, is, was it about? You know what? You know what it would be. I want to know if it would have been possible. Obviously, if the if Owen had not passed away, would it have been possible for Brett to return to WWE after WCW went? Yeah, that's interesting. That's what I want to ask him. It's so funny when I think back of uh, we we always talk about that old Iyata show. Now, were were you? I, I can't remember. Were you listening to those Iyata shows at that time? Because you're pretty young at that point. Yeah, no, dude. I was. I used to record the Iyata shows on my Iowa boombox. I had my friend's father program a timer to launch Real Player. <laughs> and it would go to automatic, like, like he cre programmed the mouse to click it and everything. And I had to leave the mouse in a certain spot that I had on my desktop. Like I had like a little X and I would have to start this program before I left to school <laughs> and it would create, it would like go and, and start recording. So I would miss about, I would say 15 minutes of the show before I got home. And then I would like re you know, I would listen to the rest and then I would listen to the first 15 minutes. So I was listening to the Yada shows from 99 on. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I'm sure. Like I've even saw old questions that I sent into the print observer. Like I would see my name in there a few different times. I'm, I'm almost sure I got questions on there as well uh, on on the show. Probably stuff involving like Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman and what was real and what wasn't. Yeah. He's like, yeah, the whole thing is a work, man. I'm like, oh my god! You know god. what? I got a bunch of questions, dude, for him. Like, I want to know what was the biggest surprise that he's ever experienced. Like something that he he was like shocked about in wrestling, right? Obviously, we know the big ones. Uh, Chris Benoit would oh, be god. number one for me, right? Like that would be the number one shocker of all time. But I'm sure there's plenty that that he's experienced in his career covering this thing because he's covered every major event to ever happen. I don't think anybody could say the same. I mean, it's there's very a very small group of people. Yeah, there's a grisly aspect to wrestling. And, you know, when the Vince McMahon, Janelle Grant stuff had come out, and you know how just sick to your stomach you were getting reading that stuff. Yeah. I always I thought about Dave because to be a reporter, you can't have a sensitive stomach to stuff like that because you have to cover it, right? Yeah. And you go back to the Chris Benoit thing. If you want to go back and read like grisly reporting, like that Chris Benoit stuff in the 2007 observers. Oh my God. I was like, I would have to like turn the lights on in my apartment back then to read. Cause I was like, this is like scaring the hell out of me. Um, but yeah, like all, you know, all, all of those stories. Like, I mean, that's why dark side of, uh, of the ring exists is because you have all of these grisly stories. So, you know, we'll get we'll get Dave on next week. And if you want to send in a super chat, you'll be able to ask him whatever he wants. I think we'll probably do it similarly to how we did Brian and uh, Vinny. The first half an hour of the show will be you and I, and then we'll save the last half an hour and maybe go a little bit longer, depending on how many questions we get for Dave. He was going to do it today, but I'm actually glad he had to postpone because then it gives us the I opportunity to, to promote it for next week. So, so everybody you brought up, you brought up super chats we got one already for today. oh my god let's let's go so kim in our in our chat in our youtube chat says uh i was at smackdown ringside in memphis so much fun never expected the rock to get so much love 
Cody yes. there. Cody there for the dark match. Got with, got photo with him. So dang over. Yeah. I, I mean, this is the hot story, right? This is a very unique hot story. And it is exactly what we are going to talk about in uh, in our first segment here. So thank you, Kim. I'm what a what a smackdown to go to. Holy cow. Like what did it, that, that I can't imagine what the reaction sounded like in the building because it sounded loud as hell through my my television. And you know, I think I mentioned this to you. I don't generally watch the wrestling shows live. I'll watch Dynamite. At, at least I try and watch Dynamite within 20 minutes of, of live. But sometimes, you know, it's dinner time for the family. I'm not always watching the full show. But these rock segments, when this when this chat about SmackDown starts in the Discord, people will at me and go, "Up, oh, rocks coming out." And then I go and log in on the Smack on the uh, Fox app on my TV because I don't get smackdown live here i get the west coast feed but if i go through the fox app i can actually watch the east coast feed and so yeah just you know in the chat uh my buddy joe gilbert was like hey rocks leading off the show so i immediately popped the app open and i got to see the beginning of the rock concert and i think most people would have figured that he was going to do this kind of segment because he's done it over the years you know, he, the famous one is the one uh, in Sacramento uh, before the Austin match where, you know, the the the, La the Lakers beat the Kings in May. Like, we're going all the way back, that line. Uh, but yeah. this time, he did it a little bit differently because he didn't have an actual guitar. He had musicians with a sort playing. of Memphis theme playing while he was singing. I thought that was amazing. Like, the the production of that entire segment was like a plus like that i was like where, where did we go back to the grammys like the grammys was only about a month ago like the same artist from the grammys are out here live on a wrestling television show um what did you think of like the spectacle of the whole thing because it just made to me it made him seem like the biggest star wrestling has ever seen be just he was just bigger than life yeah, he, I, I think, you know, when he comes in there and you see the difference in how he presents himself and how the audience uh, interacts with him, it is, it's actually unbelievable to see when, like, when you talk about a star, right? Like, top tier, top of the line star. I mean, that is who you think of is Dwayne. There's not too many people that have ever been able to capture the audience to that level, ever. So, you know, I don't I'm not going to name names. Right. But there are plenty of people in both companies that are at the top, top, top tier in in the company that they're in, either it's AEW or WWE, that will never be able to garner that kind of reaction. And it says no. something. And it says something tremendous. And you know what? There's plenty of people that have been WWE champion that will never be on the level of the rock. And when we talk about top level stars, that is what we talk about. And. Really, that has not been created in many, many years. Now, it could be that, you know, Dwayne has become such a special attraction that we react that way because of all the years that he's put in. But listen, I mean, he, he, I'm just throwing a name out there and this is no shade at anybody. When, but do you think in five to ten years, Seth Rollins will get that kind of reaction if he returns? Well, I think the comparable one is... Uh... Cena of today, right? Because remember last late last year, Cena came back because of the, the strike. And he was actually a really big ticket mover. Like people were gobbling up tickets of seeing, you know, John Cena maybe one more time, maybe one last time. Now, my relationship with John Cena is not the same as my relationship. Uh, WrestleMania 19, you remember that was Hogan versus McMahon, who was the reason for for WrestleMania. They had that angle. So Hogan was on the, the go home show. I think it was a SmackDown show. And that was the first time I ever saw him live was wow. on that show. And I was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. Like, I've ne you know, this is the first time I've ever really seen him uh, on a live show. So fast forward to uh, WrestleMania 31. So it was the 
uh, I think it was a house show. He and Flair were both on a house show in San Jose. And this is when they were going to put the on sale ticket code. If you go to this house show, you get the on sale ticket code to purchase your WrestleMania tickets or whatever. And so I went to that show. And so that was 2015. And so it's a different Hogan, right? It's 13 years later. Yeah. And I feel like the bloom was pretty much off the rose that time. And the reason is because I was like thinking like, huh, he is at a house show, not in front of the, the TV crowd. Does that mean his star has, has dimmed? I don't, I don't know if it, it had or not, but that was just sort of my You know vigil, what like, it dimmed, oh. really? I, I, I think it dimmed when people realize that he's not going to wrestle again. And the same thing happened he's, with Flair, really, too. He you know, still the keeps moment teasing that, it, though. <laughs> he will forever tease it. He's teasing it at 70 years old. One more match, brother. The guy is walking with a cane. I mean, yeah. it's terrible to see. Listen, I, I know. Hogan Hogan said some terrible stuff. He's politics for himself, his whole career. But as a kid, and I'm saying as a performer, there was nothing bigger than the first time I saw Hulk Hogan wrestle. That was, that was the moment for me. I mean, I, this, it, it was, he was a mega star. And, and you know what? That roster was packed at that time with people that we really love now. Perfect was there. Bret Hart was, you know, you had all these top names. There's nobody that was able to come close. You know who did? Warrior for a while. Yes. That reaction that he was getting. I mean, I saw Warrior Russell too. I think it really has to do with, like, one one thing I never subscribed to was the fact that Hogan and Flair, right? The story was that match didn't happen because it did terrible at the house shows. Well, not, not it did good on the shows. first. It did, it did really good on the first wave, but then they went back to it. And when they went back to it, it didn't really draw. Is that what it was? Because when I was in that building at the garden, when they, when they came out, it was like December. It was like that December show. I knew I witnessed something very special. And I'm a kid. Yeah. Seven years old, eight years old, whatever I was. I knew I saw something extremely special that these two guys were able to wrestle. I, I, I don't know if it was like a, my cousin told me or like my friend's older brother <laughs> told me about it, but like it got me hyped for it. And when it didn't happen, it was so disappointing. And then the story now is that, oh, you know, it didn't do well. Are you kidding me? You have the biggest possible match that you could possibly have. The two world champions, your competitor's world champion, that's obviously going to lose to your guy. There's no way Flair's beating Hogan. Yeah. And you don't do it? Crazy. That that whole thing, you know, I'm actually going to do a podcast uh, in the next couple of weeks where me and uh, my, my buddy Big D, we kind of break down what are the, the biggest WrestleMania matches that didn't happen. And, you know, people will say, oh, Sting and, and The Undertaker, right? Like that was kind of a, a tease. People were making like fake graphics uh, of, the, of that match. But Hogan and Flair is one of them. And in addition to the houses going down the second time around the loop. The other thing was that in order to get Sid Vicious from WCW yeah, yeah. to WWF, Vince had to promise him he was going to be uh, main eventing against Hogan at WrestleMania. Now, some may say Vince has lied to talent before. He couldn't just lie again. So, I, yeah, I agree with that part. The other part of it, though, now here's what's interesting. So if you if you do Hogan and Flair, then if you remember what was happening around that time, it was the steroid thing, and Hogan was going away. Remember, A after yeah. the vicious match, he goes away because his name is Mud, and they need to kind of distance themselves from him because of all the steroid stuff. So if you do Hogan and Flair, and Hogan re-wins the title, then he's going away. So that's another wrinkle that I don't think people think about uh, as far as that you match know, is concerned. That, that but steroid you're, you're stuff always right. baffles me it always baffles me it's like it's like oh my god what a what a what a shocker uh cheech marin does hot <laughs> you know that's how i always saw it like even as a kid i was like why is this such a big deal why is this steroid allegation such a big deal these aren't uh, these aren't uh you know baseball athletes these aren't basketball players they're not obviously not getting Olympic tested for anything. I'm like, of course they're on steroids. Like, maybe that's me because I came from the bodybuilding family and then I was constantly told how steroids were a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in my yeah. family, it was like, and like, it was never, I have a very different opinion of steroids. I don't even want to get into it because it'll dive this whole show. Uh, I, 
I am not as as I don't have a guttural reaction to people being on steroids, especially bodybuilders and professional wrestlers. That that's what about discussion. actors? I, all these listen, actors, all are of them, putting on all of them, giant muscle for roles. Uh, how did how and, does and that guess happen? What? Everybody's still on something now. Everybody yeah. is on something. I, I mean, listen, I'm not saying everybody 100, percent but it is extremely difficult. You have to be a superhero in order to maintain a physique like these guys do. And I don't want to name names, but obviously you could see to and even guys that don't that they are on some sort of either a human growth hormone, a peptide, a testosterone, something. There's no I mean, how come nobody's talking about Dwayne? Why is that not a big deal? <laughs> you think if Dwayne came out and said, I, I take steroids, I'm on everybody's going to say, yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Yeah. No, there there, I mean, there the is an interesting relationship with steroids in the media. Um, OK, so now I'm one day and this may never happen because there's always stuff going on in wrestling one day. We will have an open and honest uh, conversation about steroids just yeah, in let's general because it. yeah. it's, it's a yeah. fascinating topic. But here's the thing. In 1992, now, I was probably a little too young to know about all of these things, but because I followed wrestling and because I followed uh, sports as closely as I did, I knew about them because as a young person in 1989, the NFL started their very first steroid testing, and it wasn't because they thought it was great. It was because of a reaction to, you know, people getting ill and having heart issues. And they're like, oh, we got to look into this. Yeah. So uh, one of in, in, in 1989, Dave wrote a piece in The Observer and he's like, well, you know, one of the reasons why WWE doesn't want athletic commissions to oversee wrestling is because then the WWE won't have to pay a tax to uh, to have them there. They won't have to pay part of their gate to have these athletic commissions. WWE just didn't want. They was like, oh, we'll bring in our own doctors and, and, and that whole thing. Yeah. But a, a smaller reason that Dave mentioned is because if they actually decided that they were going to steroid test the wrestlers, it would upend WWE's entire structure because so many of their guys were on steroids. So now you fast forward to 1992. And why is this a big deal? Well, it's a big deal mostly because of lies, mostly because of people not being honest about it. And, and by lying about it, they almost made it more evil than it was in professional wrestling. Now, yeah. in athletics, sure, you're playing football. It's pretty dangerous, right? You're hitting people. Uh, in hockey, like you're body checking people. The stronger you are, it could be a little bit more dangerous. But what the reason why I think there was so much fear of it uh, at, at least in wrestling and bodybuilding, was because of what was starting to happen in the late 90s, the early 2000s. All these dudes were like 40 years old and dropping dead. Now, a lot yeah. of them were drug overdoses, right? But a lot of but them, a lot of them are also heart large related. hearts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Eddie, there was like Eddie Guerrero, this, one example. There was a mix of the lifestyle in which steroids was included. And what we saw was everybody's worst fear when it came to the steroids. So... You know, now here we are, uh, you know, for from the Eddie Guerrero time frame, which was, I think, 2006 to today, that was 18 years ago. What has changed? Well, the guys aren't as jacked up as they were even even then. But my hope and I need to ask Dave this question. I've, I've actually had this conversation with him in person, uh, but on the air, I think it'd be fascinating. My hope is that the drugs are just better right they're they're, they're that's exactly what it more is. advanced and they're not as harmful and the 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 wrestlers are smart enough to know the difference between uh what is the right amount or, or you know i don't know if people are actually microdosing testosterone but you know what what is the right amount versus you know what is not yeah. You know, what is a doctor not telling these guys and why are these guys shooting up like way more than than their body can use like that kind of thing. So there's that conversation that uh, that, you know, we, we, we could also have about sort of why you're kind of OK with it because of your experiences so much so to that. I hear they call you a TRT Zarian like in, in TRT public. Zarian. I, I'm listen, I don't I'm not advocating anybody should do anything like this, but they there is a totally a a huge difference between 
1980s anabolic steroids and yes. what people determine as, you know, human growth hormone or, or TRT today. Very different things. Very, very different. It's it's safer. Um, are there cons are there side effects? I'm sure. Listen, I've been on TRT for a year. Uh, I in high school, I did steroids too. I was an athlete. And I I have a very mixed opinion of this. I don't advocate anybody do anything like this. Uh, if this is something that you're looking to do, you got to do it safely. Um, I I understand that athletes need a competitive edge. I'm going to tell you something. A friend of mine, he was a baseball player. Okay, he's retired now. Uh, he was a decent baseball player, professionally played in the majors, and he pretty much told me something very interesting. He goes, "If every player." that ha ha is achieving something from the time that he went in, he said almost everybody was on something. And the way that they would do it, and even if they weren't, they had the availability to do it. Because in college, they were able to get a prescription for testosterone. They would go and they complain about low uh, energy and no sex life, and they, they're tired <laughs> and they can't focus. And all of a sudden, these 21-year-old kids are getting a prescription for testosterone and they don't use it. They wait. They wait until they're in their mid to late twenties or even thirties. And now they start using it. And guess what? Their performance shoots up because the baseline test, they're still leveled. They never dropped off. So what, what's the problem here? If you're baselining mm -hmm. at 800 or 900 your entire life. And as an athlete, um, they're not going to pop you for anything, and you could have another extra five to six years of your career. Right? You know, I'm throwing a number. It is all fascinating to me, and I do, and I don't think that is cheating. If you are looking to extend it from injuries, or if you're, you know, you're 40 years old, you're a star player for the New York Yankees. So I'm not going to name names. <laughs> Alex Rodriguez. Uh, you know, Biogenesis. I don't know. I know. Well, he 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 got popped hard, but. You know, if you are looking to kind of, I don't see the harm in this, in that level. You know, yeah, I don't know. This uh, is my, and I'm sure you have, people have a great argument to this and we could have a nice long discussion. I'm throwing a lot of generalities and people could pick it. I, you know, there is obvious cheating that happens, but there's also extending your career. Is that considered cheating? If you're 42 years old and you still want to continue playing ball and you get HGH, or you get uh, or you get testosterone replacement therapy to either help you uh, maintain the muscle, maintain your ability to play the, at the level that you were playing or to recover from an injury. Is that cheating? Well, I mean, this is a fascinating discussion, and I think the people that we should have this discussion with Dave Meltzer, who has said yeah. basically his entire life that he has not taken anything. I mean, the man has great genetics and also Tremendous Lance genetics. Storm. Lance Storm Lance also enough. has never taken anything. And, you know, the, I, I'm sure they would have better answers for you as to why. Because yeah. they were both in, you know, Dave was less competitive, but he was also in that culture and environment. You know, he's he's working out at Gold's Gym in, in Campbell, California, where oh, all man. the bodybuilders are working out at. And then Lance, being an active pro wrestler, uh, can you imagine what Lance would have been like on steroids? He would have been like... Uh, he, he would have been like a uh, big Papa pump, Scott Steiner, who could throw an insane drop kick. That's how his genetics are. So yeah, that, uh, how did we actually get into this? Uh, for some reason, I don't know, uh, but we, you know what? We, now we, I'm we picturing big pop Lance's face on, on Scott Steiner's body, <laughs> like a 2000 <laughs> Scott Steiner. Body. Somebody Photoshop that please. <laughs> uh, okay. Let, let's, let's go back to what we were talking about, which was rock and Cody and, and the star aspect of it all. And here's my question to you. The Rock, as the bad guy in this story, the heel, the villain, he was sure not treated like the villain. And I was having a discussion with uh, my buddy Paul Fontaine about this. The Rock was being mean, but he was being an ass-kicking mean rather than a wait, cowardly wait, when? mean. Uh, wait, on the, during the, the TV promo or, or the, the TV YouTube promo. video? Or, or well, the, both okay. of them. Because he kept talking yeah. about Mama Rhodes and how he was going to beat Cody up with the belt and he's going to beat him bloody and he's going to hand the belt to Mama Rhodes. And so that is kind of a heel mannerism. But at the same time, 
he's the ass kickingest guy. And I was having this conversation. I was saying, you know, at one point, Stone Cold Steve Austin pointed a fake gun at Vince McMahon and pulled the trigger and Vince peed his pants. That was really <laughs> mean, too. But Austin yeah. was an ass kicking person. And that's what made him a baby face, not him doing good deeds. So, you know, I think this this idea of what makes a baby face and what makes a heel is a little bit gray anyways. But I watch Rock on that thing and I was like, yeah, OK, he's he's daring Mama Rhodes, but. At the same time, he's basically saying, I'm going to beat Cody Rhodes's ass. So that to me, that makes him a baby face. But then Cody has to answer that promo. And so Cody had to dial it up last night on Raw. And if I compare the two promos, one was kind of like an all-time great performance. And the other one was a good promo that was a little bit try-hardy. And you know what the funniest thing is? And this is not, this is kind of tangentially related, but I watch LA Knight on SmackDown and I'm like, we have the real thing. Like, okay. the rock. I, I, I have a whole show. different opinion. I have a whole okay, different opinion than you on this. Okay, and, go ahead. Uh, I, I really like those LA Knight promos. And I don't, I understand there is obviously influence from The Rock and Steve Austin there. Yeah. But also, it is, it's a pro wrestling promo, and we just don't see that too often. It's sure. just, that cadence has been delivered by everybody. Yeah, you know that cadence is something that has happened. Uh, uh, sorry, my phone is buzzing, and I can't turn this off. Here we go. That that entire thing ha has been nineteen eighty seven, late seventies to 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 the Rock current day. That is a wrestling promo. So I don't compare it that way and you know what taking influence from somebody that has achieved it and you're cutting that style of promo i really love that style of pro wrestling promo i don't like the real conversation i love mm -hmm. it i love a little bit of the cartoonishness the hype in a promo the hype. yeah the i hype love the hype all. i could still appreciate every other thing i mean there's plenty of people that cut tremendous promos that don't do that right roman reigns is one uh cody is one uh, just it's it's evolved. It's changed. So okay. So here's here's my question. Yeah. Did did the Rock overshadow Cody Rhodes in your opinion, uh, based off of what what they've done in the last couple weeks? I, I think the Rock's overshadowing everybody, the entire company. Uh, I, think so I don't too. think it's a Cody problem. And I think Cody Cody yesterday. I I liked. I thought he delivered yesterday. He was he um, had fire. I don't like, he had fire. I don't like the crying promos from Cody. <laughs> um. <laughs> you know like i'm not a fan of those but i understand he's trying to tell a story so yeah yeah i don't have to love every promo that he cuts i just have to like it and i have to it has to continue the story i, I have to believe it really fired i have to believe it i have to believe it and i do believe it when he talks yeah, yeah. um but you know listen the rock is going to overshadow every single person in that company including yeah. his cousin because you know what nobody is talking about roman nobody everybody's talking about Dwayne and cody Okay, I have a theory about Roman. Yeah, give me. Roman's last couple of years has been all about work smarter, not harder, right? Roman is about to lose this belt, and yet The Rock is doing all of the work to make the match. And Roman is chilling. He's hanging. He wasn't even on SmackDown, from what I remember. He's just... Like, can you imagine the the idea that the main heel in the main event of Re WrestleMania just, yeah, we don't need him. We got the rock. Let let Roman hang out with his family and, and, and uh, you know, chill at home. And so yeah. this almost fits the character that Roman is just like, oh, yeah, like, I, you know, I, I'm not I, I don't have to work today. Of course, I don't have to work today. You think I got to hype up this WrestleMania? I got other people to do that for me. That kind of makes him the head of the table in, in a weird way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, Rock is overshadowing everybody. Uh, Seth is trying. I would say the best person doing the uh, their character work for this WrestleMania after The Rock, it's not Cody. It's not do you Seth. you want to do it on three? Do you want to say it on three? Because I think we're yeah. thinking the same person. It'd be funny if we're not, okay? In okay. three, one, two, one. Drew. Drew. Yeah. There you go. Absolutely. He's the best. 
Okay, so I, uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a little a little behind the scenes kind of secret secret here, but uh, my buddies from uh, the Ringer, uh, they were recording their show. Uh, uh, the, uh, David Shoemaker, uh, w- the show that he's on. I think they had Drew on yesterday, and uh, my buddy sent me like a little bit of the uh, a screenshot of the Zoom uh, of it. And do you can you do you know what Drew McIntyre signed into Zoom as? What? CM Punk. <laughs> what? A, that's great. I mean, that's so good. That's so good. He's the savior yeah. of WrestleMania. Uh, I think he's been yeah. doing. And, and you know why? So Seth. Seth's character is very over the top, right? It's very boisterous. It's over the top. He's leaning into being a wrestling junkie. He's the you know, needs the spotlight. The Rock is over the top in his own way. He's just using his natural charisma and his uh, understanding of how to act and timing and everything. And and Cody is just being like the realist version uh, of the Cody Rhodes character. Whereas Drew, Drew is doing something different altogether. And I think that's what makes him stand out. Like, I know... Drew and Seth is going to be overshadowed. It is on night two. It's not even going to be the main event of night two. It's going to be in the middle of the show or maybe even the opening match or whatever. But I I may not be rooting for someone to win more than I am rooting for Drew McIntyre to win this match at WrestleMania. Yeah, I, I want to see him with that title. And you know what? You, you don't really get too many second chances in pro wrestling. Okay. You don't get third chances. Yeah. This guy was there ever. You barely get third chances. This guy was there. He left. He came back better than ever. And he, in a very short period of time, from the time that they decided to push him to the time that he won that title, he got extremely, extremely over with the audience. And we talk about it all the time. Unfortunately, he got effed. Pandemic happened. He wasn't able to have that moment beating Brock Lesnar, being the Kingslayer. And, you know, he, he suffered from that. And now, out of nowhere, he's got that stock rising again. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, he's a giant of a man. Handsome, giant man with a great body. I'm not saying that because sometimes I look like him. If you look <laughs> at me, when I had my hair long and put, put in a ponytail, you look quickly. You're like, ah, oh, okay, I can kind of see it with the beard. I, I, it's weird. I get in. I get Andrade sometimes, and I get Drew sometimes. You're like it a mix. If I went both tanning, of them. yeah, it, you're, it, you're it like a you're like greatest mix of both. <laughs> Listen, I've been going to Beach Bum a little bit, so I'm a little bit darker today. When I'm when I'm pale, I I, I get the Drew. Um, it, I think it's amazing how he transformed his character with a slight adjustment. He's not doing anything totally different. He's just speaking differently. He's not fired up he's like a realist and that works that's the total opposite end right i I spoke about how much i love the la Knight style of promo but this is also unbelievable i want him to beat seth and i want him and punk to be in the match that i mean i didn't we weren't talking about him and punk until he got it hurt yeah you know the thing about drew i think he i think i i mean you would have to ask him and i i haven't heard the uh the ringer uh, interview yet but i wonder if you gave him some truth serum if he saw the cm punk tell me when i'm telling lies character and was like oh i can actually do a version of that in wwe because all he's doing is telling the truth from his perspective and the fans look at it and go oh yeah i could totally see what he's saying like that is that he's actually yeah. telling the truth here in this ironic way but i wonder i do wonder if that cm punk character uh it was a little bit of an inspiration okay so well, you know let's what, you know what's an inspiration a guy that you were told to dislike coming back and now you're thinking wow well i could take this as a great opportunity and have a match a dream match that nobody thought could possibly happen you know yeah. that motivates you yeah yeah, and absolutely. it might have motivated Drew to kind of tweak it and, and to be in the position he's in now because that's I'm very interested to see him win the title. And if if he hadn't tweaked that character, if Punk had not gotten hurt, I probably would not have so much interest in a Drew McIntyre match at WrestleMania. OK, 
so as we get cl- i think what what are we like two and a half weeks away from wrestlemania now is that what it is we're two and something a, like is that it, man it's here it's pretty close so night one we have the match that you were not you were not really interested in uh, originally, which was the Rock and Roman against uh, Cody and Seth. And then night two has the two big title matches. Um, what like if you were to compare your interest for this year's WrestleMania uh, on a one to ten scale, and maybe ten is like WrestleMania seventeen. Like I don't remember being more excited for a WrestleMania than uh, 17, seventeen. At least as at least as an adult. Yeah, maybe, maybe, probably WrestleMania three for when I was a kid, but WrestleMania seventeen as an adult, like that was like pretty, pretty big stuff. Uh, other as than a kid, ones fourteen. That I was going to. Uh, okay, that's a good one. Fourteen, I was very excited for because I wanted to see Austin win the title, and Sean was my one of my favorites. So obviously, I want to see that match, and it was a bad match. It wasn't great, and it wasn't <laughs> you know it wasn't the best WrestleMania, but I was very excited for it. But also, uh, eighteen. I was so psyched for 17, probably the best, one of the best yeah. WrestleManias ever. Psyched for that. Uh, I very much liked 18, though. That was that was a big deal for me. So where would if if 17 and 18 were like a 10 on the scale of Andrew Zarian's interest, where would you put yeah. 40? Um, I don't know, maybe like a seven. Interesting. Okay, maybe six and a half. Maybe six and a half. Maybe seven. Because from what I'm gauging to the general audience, I I, I can't I I don't know this for a fact, obviously, but it feels like to a non wrestling audience, this is like the biggest WrestleMania in a long time. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, you you have some huge matches there, right? Like, yeah, you, uh, you got the Rock back. That tag match is going to be hot. The main event of Night Two is going to be hot. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. It just I think maybe I'm a little bit jaded now when because mm-hmm. we talk about it so much and we watch sure. it so much. So my perspective, yeah, sense. I, I never I don't want to I don't want to push my perspective of excitement on it. Um, I will tell you for every Royal Rumble, it's always a 10 for me going into it because that is my <laughs> favorite thing to watch. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. It, it could just be where my head's at. But I'm, I've never been a fan of the two night thing. So that automatically drops everything down a notch because. You're not per, you're not giving me the best possible card you 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 can deliver because you're changing it. Yeah, and I think I don't think we're going back because if you can sell the house out twice instead of just once, why wouldn't you, yeah. right? Because I would you know what I would prefer? I would prefer night 1 of WrestleMania actually being a 3-hour smackdown. And then night two is like the Sunday pay-per-view. And then like WrestleMania aftermath is like, uh, is raw. I would prefer it that way because like you, I don't want to watch two four hour shows back to back uh, on Saturday and Sunday, but that is, that is kind of the deal. All right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the big business show that just happened. I'm very interested uh, about what you thought about the Mercedes Monet interview segment. Um, you know, I, it was interesting for sure. Um, you know, obviously she, there's nerves, right? And I, I, I think that plays a part in it too. I thought it was fine. I, I, I thought the crowd loved it. They were into her. She came back at the end. That was great too. Um, it was fine. It was, it was what I, what I thought it would be. I don't think this model works though. Yeah. They they really tried the CM Punk model. Yeah. And you know, it's easy to say in hindsight that this wasn't, you know, CM Punk is not the same. And not not talking about star power, just talking about the fact that CM Punk had, had left the way he did WWE, had all that negativity, left the business, did not want to wrestle anymore. There were attempts to get bring him back. Nope, nobody he didn't want to come back. And we finally got him to come back to this hot alternative. It's not the yes. same. Seven years have not gone by for Mercedes to return. Yes. And listen, and I'm not, again, I, I never criticize the talent, but Mercedes Monet is not CM Punk. It's not the same. I would have rather, you know, if they had announced it, I, it would have made more sense to me. Because, and the argument is everybody knew, right? Everybody knew. Well, did they? 
because AEW fans for sure knew because that's their core audience. They had the 800,000 there. They had a million at that segment. But how about, um, again, how about the 13-year-olds that only watch WWE? Did they know? Not everybody lives on Twitter. Not yeah, everybody's living on Instagram. Do they know? Do, uh, were, they, were they told Mercedes Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks, is now debuting tonight? What would that have done to the number? I don't know what that number would have been. I don't know what that demo for her is. Uh, whether or not it would have helped or not, it wouldn't have hurted. That's for sure. Hurted. Hurt. <laughs> That's for sure. It, it wouldn't um, have hurt. Uh, no, you know, I, I you agree. Put in you. another 500 to 1,000 people in that building? Possibly. Could that number have changed for the viewership? Quite possibly. I, don't, I would imagine, yes, it would have. I don't know if it was 1,000 people or, or 5,000 people. I don't know what that number would have been. I also think the other option could have been, hey, we don't have to do this. Here she comes. It could, she could pop in a match, come through the crowd, do something, and get that crowd going. I will say, for a show called Big Business, the thing I disagreed with most on the show was the future business or lack thereof that they created from that moment. Because I love the presentation. I think the presentation was a 10 out of 10. She seemed like a giant star. Uh, people cheered for her. They were there to, you know, somewhat to see her. And then the promo happened. And then it was like a six and a half to me. Because, yeah, you know, I not that, you know, we need the bullet points and all that stuff. And maybe Tony just, you know, maybe Mercedes said, hey, I just want to explain why I love this and why I'm back. And we'll worry about everything else later. But to me, you're going to have so many eyeballs on this moment. You want to maximize the eyeballs. I wanted to know who was going to be the next, who's going to be her first target to wrestle. Why don't we even create a match? Why don't we create her first match out of this moment? so that we get people excited for a future dynamite or future collision. But she didn't set anything up. And then she was so vague in her coming back to the end of the show, either people didn't care, which is what I, I hope that that wasn't the case, or they just didn't know because you put uh, Riho and, and Willow in the main event. And I love both of those women. I think Riho's and a like, lot of people turned it off. Yeah. Riho's is such a tremendous uh, underdog baby face. But the people didn't come back. And so you missed Mercedes. And, and there will be some people who go, oh, but Mercedes did a promo with Riho that showed you. And I was like, well, that was already so late in the show. You're only showing that to the hardcores already, like unless you expect them to call their friends or whatever. So I think they could have done a lot of other things for the business aspect of taking advantage of this moment because they... They doubled down on the surprise thing, like you said, the CM Punk thing. And I think we said when it happened, like there's differences to this model yeah. uh, between CM Punk and, and Mercedes. So we're not really Monday morning quarterbacking that. We we pretty much said that we wished that they did it a different way. Um, and I just wish that they actually created some business out of that moment for Mercedes. I think that was the one thing missing. Yeah, I... We'll see what it means on Wednesday, you know? We'll what see did what you it means. I mean, also, they're trying to milk it, too, right? Now you had the appearance, then you have another appearance, and then you have some sort of interaction. You're trying to build it week by week, and I understand that. But if it was done a different way, maybe it might have been done better. I It's hard to tell. What did you think about this tag team tournament that they're doing? Yeah, do we have brackets? There is a bracket. This is this is the March Madness one, right? Which it's it's unfortunate because you know when you and maybe Tony Khan didn't even say this. Maybe it was Dave kind of hyping this up. But you have this idea of March Madness. I, my my brain went into, oh my gosh, we could do like a sixteen team tournament, and we can get all the way to the pay per view and just have these great tag team main events on on all these tv shows and when it turned out to what the bracket was it was pretty poor i thought i i you know uh you, you get the young bucks 
you get FTR, you get Ricky Starks and Big Bill. Those are the top three teams. Where's Claudio and Mox? Didn't they beat FTR? Where is Claudio? Yeah. Well, there's two wild cards, right? So the the one of the wild cards has already uh, become a, a team in the tournament. The Infantry okay. beat the House of Black on Collision, yeah. so they're actually in the tournament. Their their first round matchup is FTR. They're taking yeah. a major L uh, in that match. And then the second wild card is the Best Friends versus uh, the Callis family, Don Callis family, which is I think that is going to be on the Rampage Hour of our three hour show on wednesday because there's no friday rampage show they're putting rampage no collision into the hour into the last hour of dynamite so we got a three hour essentially a three hour dynamite on wednesday night yeah i wonder if it's a test to see if that could be sustained you know what though if you are going to do hmm. a test i would not call it rampage i would just call it a three hour dynamite because they are calling they have one to. hour they have of to for at I Isn't know it, it's the same. Yeah, they have to call a rampage. It's the same reason why, you know, Battle of the Belts is called Battle of the Belts. And it's like a two hour thing. And they do two blocks, you know. When they would if do you wanted that. to Remember, do a true what, what test, show was it? Yeah, yeah, you could you, you just call it, it dynamite, dynamite but... and just do three hours. Yeah, but yeah. but like you said, there's reasons that you have to do it that way. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, unless they you know, you have the two hours of dynamite to really try and get people to stick around for that third hour of, of rampage and maybe you know, the way to do it is to, I don't know who they're, who, who is AEW's top draw right now? If you said, this is the person we want to be on the show that is going to drive the maximum amount of viewers, who would that person even be? That's, that's currently available for them. That's yeah. like working. I, well, that's, that's very telling, right? Cause now I need to think about it. And in previous well, years, I would have said CM Punk, Kenny Omega. It's not, M Jericho, not MJF. MJF, MJF is yeah. not, not working right now. I mean, it would have is to be it Joe and Swerve? Yeah, I was thinking Swerve. Osprey. Um, I was thinking, well, Osprey, not yet, but it, it sure feels like he's going to be there at some point. Okay, so let's say let let's do this as an experiment. Let's say that they had a groundbreaking angle or announcement to make. I guess the answer is they use Tony Khan in that moment, right? Because he's always the one that does that announcement. Like the Tony Khan special announcement may be one of the bigger draws in AEW. Because what <laughs> I was going to say- special announcement is number one, yeah. <laughs> because what I was going to say is, is if you announce something for that third hour of Rampage and you want to see how much audience you can stick around, who do you have tie in? Like you have somebody at the beginning of Dynamite, and you do an angle and you say this angle will pay off, but you got to stick around for the third hour of Rampage and then you will see the payoff. I guess Tony Khan would be the person to make that as a special announcement rather than the wrestlers. Yeah, um, but that's that's bad. That's not good. Because I could I could tell you right now who the biggest, you know, the biggest draw in w AEW in WWE is. I could tell you the top three. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and it's a very different product. Like for me, it's Danielson. I love watching those wacky Danielson matches, the wacky pairings. I'm into that. That's what I want to yeah, watch. Yeah, I didn't for, watch. For me, I, I didn't get a chance to watch. I was in Vegas this week, so I didn't really watch any wrestling this weekend. But you know, for me, that's a that's a draw. Now, that's not your. That's not the typical wrestling fan. Yeah. Uh, I I don't. I mean, listen, Okada and the Bucks for sure. For me, for me. You know, Moxley for me. I would say Moxley right now, but is he in the top picture? No, he's not. Who's in the top picture? You yeah. got Swerve, you got Hangman, and you got you got Joe. Yeah, see, for me, it's like, how do you make this third hour of Rampage feel special? Well, maybe you do like, you know, maybe you do the whole first round of this tournament on this show. And, you know, I, I know he needs it for the rest of the shows. But I was just trying to think of how do you get people to stick around for this third hour? Maybe it's just that Dynamite is good and people are like, heck, I want to I want to see a third hour of this. And maybe they will. I, I don't imagine that they will. I imagine I imagine this will be a, a higher rated segment, a higher rated Rampage show just by having the Dynamite lead in than they did on Friday, which was like. 320,000 people or whatever it was. Look, can I ask you, let me ask you this, okay? 
and, and you know, we have a pay-per-view coming up this month. But as far as the world title goes, right? No, you mean uh, you have next month? Uh, I'm sorry, next month. Yeah, uh, yeah, twenty yeah. first. Yeah, April twenty first. When you know you're looking at that show, and you're gonna, you obviously Joe's the world champion, and obviously Swerve is in the mix. Do you think it would be beneficial if they pivoted? And I'm not, I'm not suggesting. I'm just throwing this question, and I want the audience to to answer because I want to gauge this. Would it be beneficial to to any level if Okada just came in there and just became the world champion and just held that freaking title for a while? Just he's so good. He's just you can't beat him. Would that be better? And and he holds on to that title for months. He just squashes everybody because he's Okada. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna throw a name. Swerve comes in and challenges him, or MJF returns. Mm -hmm. And somebody beats him. Would that solidify, a, you know, the next champion as being, oh, man, you beat Okada for the world title. That's a big deal. Or does it not matter if Okada has a world title or not? I think. I think it matters because and he is one of the few that would make it matter, but it's to a hardcore audience, right? It's to us. It is not to. The person who tunes in, you know, once every two or three weeks, they probably weren't watching New Japan. But who are they I into? Think, those guys. Probably MJF. Probably MJF, and he's not there. You know, I, I like the, that guy that tunes in every two to three weeks. Is he is he impressed by Swerve? Like I'm so impressed. I, I I really think Swerve should be the next guy. I, I think you have a very unique opportunity to do something a little different here. And take one of your guys and make him the champion outside of the big names. You know, like Swerve is on his rise. He's not on the 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 exit. Joe is Joe is exiting, you know, and mm -hmm. you look at the AW World Champions that they've had. Joe, you know, he's at the end of his career. Obviously, he's still one of the best, but he's at the end. Better than uh, uh, Chris Jericho at the end. Kenny Omega came in banged up. He's not that active. He's at the end, I think. Okay. So between Mox, yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, because I, that's the saddest thing to me, because if if you ask me, twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, who is the greatest wrestler currently, and who's your favorite? It's Oka it, It's obviously, I mean, Okada, obviously, but it's Kenny Omega. He yep. was different, and it worked. But the guy is so beat up from his from wrestling. But if you if you take all of those out, who who has been the guy? They MJF really is the only one. Then you have Moxley, already an established guy. And Hangman, the other one. Punk on his way out. End of the career. So it's interesting how they've done this. Um, you know, Swerve would be a guy that could carry it. But then what happens? You also have Jay White there. You also have Osprey there. You have, I mean, unbelievable talent that should be in the mix with each other. Everybody should be in the mix with each other. Make me want us know. Or make me want someone to lose. That is the key here. I want to know what's next. What's coming. And I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> this is funny because Dave, Brian and Dave were talking about New Japan uh, earlier this morning on Wrestling Observer Radio. And Dave was talking about how Yoda Suji, uh, you know, should probably be a top person because yeah. when business is struggling you kind of need to shoot the that person who you feel may be the one into the spot sooner than later when you are a successful company you can actually take your time with that rise yeah. and i wasn't even thinking about this when he was saying it but you just mentioning swerve now aw is is you know maybe from a uh, a gate or an attendance standpoint, they may be struggling. So, so maybe there would be reason, but you saying that Swerve is on his ascent and Samoa Joe is kind of leveling off a little bit. That tells me that Swerve should win this title, right? Because sooner than later, you need to, you need to start capitalizing on the folks that fans are investing in. They are investing in Swerve. They are investing 
in Will Ospreay at some point. Like maybe the numbers aren't really there for him yet, but you, you they're investing in Swerve, much like they were investing in in MJF, and he got the title. So I would say sooner than later, maybe that the ideal is to give Swerve the world title, the world title, and then see what happens. And I'm going to uh, do a, ter- a terrible comparison here. Okay, okay I'll do a terrible it. comparison here because I'm I'm trying to come up with a name. Generally, when when that works, right? That that up and coming guy wins the world title for the first time. They have to be the prime focus of the company. They have to be the flagship. Swerve is not the flagship. He is not the prime focus. And it ends up not meaning much. That's my only fear here. Because you have a lot of moving parts now between Osprey and Okada and what the Bucks are doing. He's not the prime focus. What would happen? You know, 1998, Shawn Michaels uh, in Austin. Yeah, Austin wins the main event and wins the title, but guess what happened? Hulk Hogan was wrestling in a in a in a huge match, and that was that was the attraction. That's what people wanted to see was Hogan mm-hmm. to your core audience. That would have impacted the entire trajectory of Steve Austin. I'm not saying that Swerve is Steve Austin. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. I'm saying you need to put so much more focus on that. This man is dangerous. This man could beat him, and he will be. A, a major contender in this company. I feel like the focus kind of shifted a little bit with a lot of the moving parts between mm-hmm. Mercedes being the focus, Okada being the focus, Osprey being the focus. Where's your world title now? Right. I hear you. I, and, and again, I'm I'm saying this because I absolutely love professional wrestling. I'm not saying this because I don't like AEW or I'm, I'm I don't like WWE. I, I it's pretty obvious where my wrestling likes are. And it generally leads to AEW and New Japan and that kind of style. But I'm also able to kind of recognize, listen, you need that WWE-isms a little bit in your product. You need that a little bit because it's entertainment. So I think, you know, I think we both agree. And you know what? If Kazuchika Okada beats Eddie Kingston tomorrow night, which I I think Dynamite tomorrow is actually... Is actually a more loaded show than last week. So I, I, I'm really excited for tomorrow's show. Okay, so let's say Okada beats Eddie Kingston. And let's say Swerve beats Samoa Joe. And he's the world champion. I would love to see Okada and Samoa Joe for that, you know, that continental belt or whatever it is that we believe Okada's going to win. Okay, last thing. And because you said another thing that I thought was really smart that made me think of something. Who is that person? Who is the the person that people are tuning into, and you know the the non the the non hardcore probably MJF maybe a little bit of some of these old guys like Edge who are coming in, but uh, Adam Copeland, but maybe now, maybe now that person becomes Mercedes, and so this goes back to what I was saying earlier, and and the reason why I was a little bit disappointed in that, I wanted to see Mercedes create that thing, the next thing for us to look forward to and maybe she does it on dynamite um on dynamite tomorrow but i guarantee you unless she opens the show and she may maybe she will she's not going to have that same audience that same television audience to then promote the next thing but maybe it becomes mercedes and what have we been asking aew for for the longest time which is some main event attractions on the women's side. And that's why I think Mercedes is really important because now. Yeah, listen, you you got Mercedes. Mercedes is the one. Ronda, the fact that Ronda Rousey walked in to, to, and I mean, there's a backstage story here, right? There's, there's more to this, but you know, you don't think that was an attempt to some extent to see if Ronda would be interested in kind of coming into the mix. I mean, that's a box office attraction. Forget about, forget about that last run. And how people crapped all over her. I people would be I, so I think, to, uh, if AEW fans would dislike Ronda. I think <laughs> it's it's, an, it's a weird thing. But it, why? Okay, you want to know everything why? that they should like on orthodox wrestling style. She's an ass kicker. She's a legitimate fighter. Um, if, if we're talking her political yes, uh, point of why. preference. I mean, listen. It, you know what? I'm able to separate all the things. All, th- th- Andrew, you I'm like able to money. Separate the dopiness. I like money. I know, and that's the. Thing. 
I like money and that and that is that that is how I think. I'm like, you you shut the F up. I don't care what your politics are. How much money can we make right now? Unless you're a well, heinous it, human being and you're saying some stuff that that's absolutely insane. I mean, she did say some insane stuff, but I just look at that as just being a dopey wrestler that's not yeah, yeah. in the know of things. And that's fine. all re- and all wrestlers I, I, have a megaphone now and for for I know better and, or and, in most everybody cases, has a megaphone. Yeah. Everybody has a megaphone. And you know what? If I was a dictator, I would remove everybody's megaphone <laughs> and you got to pay me the nine ninety nine a month to get your blue check mark and to be able to talk to people. Wait, that, that is what happened. That yes, is what exactly. happened. No, listen, I, 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 but you know what I mean? You, you, you have opportunities and we could go a little bit. I, I'm, I feel like things are flowing. If you want to go like five more minutes, Garrett, I can't. Yeah, let's go. Let's, yeah, we can keep going. Uh, Cause I think this is a really interesting conversation about the state of AEW and the state of professional wrestling. WWE is no longer professional wrestling. I know that they're saying wrestling again, and I know they're going back a little bit more. It is something very different. And I didn't grow up on this version of WWE. I grew up on professional wrestling. We're probably, Garrett, you and I are the last generation of fans that have grown up with pro wrestling without the WWE stuff that they do. I can't. I don't want AEW to turn into that because we saw what happened to TNA when they attempted that. But man, who is the guy I'm turning into, uh, turning in for? Who is the guy? Who is the girl I'm t- tuning in to, to, to collision for? Who are those people? Who is your top five? Where you tell me these are mega stars and you're a fool for not watching? I think what ends up happening in AEW is that there's a lot of unbelievable talent that is already established and they've done everything that they could in wrestling and guess what they don't give a shit to be the world champion and to be the number one guy there's a lot of those and we saw that guaranteed contract baby you got a guaranteed contract you know what you're making and you know what you're having fun you've already done it all you've wrestled everywhere and look somebody in time you're wearing an aw jacket of course why can't i and and guess what i'm wearing underneath here i'm wearing a hulk hogan t-shirt I just have no sleep, so I put it on. And I haven't done push-ups for the last week. So I, I feel a little... Uh, don't body shame me, Desmond. Come on, Desmond. I Andrew Andrew on, only Desmond. works for AEW some of I am, the time. Not uh, all guys, time. I am one of the most unbiased people when it comes to professional wrestling because I don't give a shit about the, the acronym or the letters or the company. I just want to see really good wrestling. That's all I care about. And whether yeah. if that's in... If that's a WWE product, great. If that's an AEW product, great. That's all I give a shit about. Best if it's case scenario, show, great. it's both, right? The best thing for the industry is both. that both companies are hot, which is really hard to do. And, and, and the thing that's frustrating about AEW to me is that they have probably the best roster I've ever seen in any company. I've never seen a company to have this deep of a performance roster. Forget about having the Hulk Hogan's and the Kevin Nash's, and Scott Hall's, right? All great names. The, the, the talent pool that this company has, and not just in ring, ability to talk, ability to capture an audience. I want to see all these guys and girls do great. Now with Mercedes there, I, I, it's going to elevate that division. There's mm-hmm. no question about it. Whether or not it's at the level that you think it is, that's fine. Uh, but it will elevate it. As far as the men's roster goes, you have <laughs> Okada, Will Ospreay, and everybody else. How are you? Uh, you know, it, it's kind of disappointing, right? You see those ratings. You're like, how are you not doing 950,000? Forget about TV. How are you not putting 4,000 people in a building? Yeah. How? It's not. You know, at some point, you got to say, maybe it's not about the talent and what we're doing on TV. Maybe it's about everything else that we're doing. To get us there. WWE's a machine. They're on their eighth or ninth sellout straight. That has not happened in a very long time. But the other part is when WWE is hot, guess what happens? And Dave says this all the time. Everybody else is doomed. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. They capture that core audience and the eyeballs. And guess what? How many hours of wrestling are you going to watch? And if I have to choose, if I'm just a, you know, if I'm a casual fan and I'm flipping through or I know SmackDown is on, I know Raw's Raw's on. And I've watched six, you know, six hours already. Do I have another two in me? 
And for AEW, you know, that that's a detriment, obviously. But my bigger concern is, you know, TV's TV. And AEW could flatline and still be over 600,000 viewers a week, right? That's a very big possibility. That's their core audience, and they will always do that. Remember TNA? We would always talk about how they will never drop below 300,000 because that was like their core audience. They always did the same number when Mm -hmm. they were like falling. I don't think that's the case for AEW. However, your house, what you're doing as far as attendance goes, is a key indicator if you are hot. And right now, they're not. And that's unfortunate because the wrestling is better than ever. Yeah. Now, can people hear John or is that only in my ear? And I'm going to respond to the ether. It's only in my ear. (laughs) It's in the ether. It's in our ears. It's in our ears. Now I I know what uh, Mick Foley felt when Vince was in his ear. Garrett, you and I were at that show. We, I know but Vince is in my he's yelling at me. You have to hear what he does during Observer Live, dude. He's just screaming at me like Vince. <laughs> pronouns, pal. He just keeps screaming pronouns, pal. He, she, they, them. No, different pronouns. Uh, <laughs> I, I. We were at that show in in Chicago. All out 2021. I have never been to a better show than that. That was the most yeah. fun show I've ever had. And you know why? My wife is not a huge wrestling fan whatsoever. She tolerates it, okay? My wife tolerates it. It's been been in part of her life for almost 20 years with me. Yep. You have to, uh, you have to look beyond your personal preference. When she's engaged and she's watching this match, and you know what she got into? That that cage match Mm -hmm. with with the Bucks. She was stunned by it. She was stunned by it. She had. She said, I've never seen anything like this. This show felt like a rock concert. And that was, and that's, that's very telling. And that's how I measure if something is hot or not. When somebody that is not necessarily your hardcore audience, your P1 audience, is committed to, to watching the show and is into watching the show, that's when you know things are shifting. We're not there right now with this company. And it's unfortunate because they, I, I absolutely love watching AEW. Yep. All right. Last part of this show, since we are in the OT, the overtime portion of yes. We're Live, pal. I just saw this story. This is kind of uh, not, not really breaking news, but I know this came out today. Did you know that Bellator, which is now like the third of the MMA brands, uh, the uh, Professional Fighters League, acquired bellator so they're technically the same company they had been on showtime previously do you know where they are now going to be airing their fights no where max really starting this friday they just signed a deal with max um and this show upcoming on friday is uh, in belfast so so yeah, so that's that's where they are going. Uh, yeah, TNT Sports will also air some content, as will True TV, and Max will have the entire library of Bellator on the service. That is kind of interesting, and the wow. reason I bring this up that is because is. you have been on more than anybody that if AEW re-ups with Warner Brothers, that you believe that they will end up on Max as well for their pay-per-views. Yeah, and and quite possibly simulcasting, uh, you know, possibly collision and dynamite on there. Also, uh, that was that was interesting. You know, a lot of people have asked me about what's the recent development. I guess I guess I'll give you a little scoop at the end, right? Um, I I, I think this simulcasting is a very real discussion to have. I've heard it from multiple sides, but I I will say there has been a recent development in getting this deal done tony seems to think so right some of the comments that he's made i i and i probably i i think it's because of the same same reasoning i listen i i'm i'm trying to protect people here (laughs) and it's not anybody on the AEW side i wasn't told that this by somebody that works in AEW. i was told somebody outside of it uh actually strangely enough someone that is not on the warner side either um, I do think there is a major development the last, 
I don't know, maybe a couple months, maybe a month, maybe two months. I don't know the time frame here, but I've never doubted that they weren't staying on Ma- on on Turner. Uh, I've never doubted that they're not going to Max. It's just a matter of getting that deal done. But everything now that we're seeing with Max streaming Bellator, like you said, which I did not know about, and getting the archive, which I did not know about, kind of uh, amplifies the conversations that I've heard. Shout it, out it makes to, more sense now. Shout out to Ryan Frederick, who uh, writes the UFC recaps in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and who comes on with Dave and I post uh, UFC shows. He was the one who told me about this information. And so then I, I, are, I looked are you it and up. Dave to gonna do, are you and Dave going to do like a, like the Mike Tyson, uh, Jake Paul uh, <laughs> recap also? Do you know how excited uh, I am for that? I looked at my wife and I said, I want to go to Arlington for that fight. Yeah, no, I, I've never I seen a Tyson fight. Never seen it. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. We haven't discussed it, but uh, I think it is, it is, it's a fascinating thing. The problem is, is this audience uh, that, you know, that pays for the subscription. It's mostly a pro wrestling audience. Even the MMA stuff is less popular than it, than it has been in the past. So, you know, if we do stuff, it's usually has to be about pro wrestling, unless it's a big UFC show. I wonder what the crossover is with the audience who watches pro wrestling and the Mike Tyson, I, Jake Paul thing. I, I, I don't know. For me, I, I'm so into it. Like, I want to see Tyson just knock his head off. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I mean, I, I, you know, he's one of the greatest boxers of all time against one of the best, uh, I guess, attraction fighters of all time, right? He would one, be an attraction one boxer. One of the best marketers of himself in a long time, you know, I think, Jake Paul. I got to tell you, Jake Paul, Jake Paul is an unbelievable athlete, great boxer. Same with his brother. Same with Logan. Great boxers. But the, the, the Fury fight, the Tommy Fury fight mm-hmm. was very telling to yeah. uh, his, his actual professional ability. Not that he, you know, he put up a fight for sure, but Tommy Fury is not a top of the line boxer. No. And I don't care. Mike Tyson's 57 years old, and this guy is doing all of the top of the line training and analytical uh, boxing. Did you see what they were doing with um, how they were training him? I, or... I only saw the, the little workout video that he put up. So w- when he did, when he did the... Um, the, the fight over the pandemic against Roy Jones, right? Yes. Roy Jones Jr. He was doing like muscle stimulation where they're, they're strapping him to see like if there's any muscle fatigue and they're charging those muscles up. I mean, they were doing state-of-the-art endurance stuff with this guy. And you look at him, you know, he's 57 years old. I, you know, fatigue could be a thing. You know, he's gotten hit in the head a whole lot more than than Jake Paul has in his life that could play a part, but he's still Mike Tyson. And this guy is not wired like anybody else on this planet. So, I mean, he, he's I'm probably so going to be by this. He's probably going to be 30 pounds heavier as well. Cause Jake is a, you know, if Jake was actually a competitive boxer versus the attraction fighter that he is, I'm guessing he would probably at, at best be uh, a super middleweight. And that's like yeah. 168. And so Tyson is legitimately 225, 230 pounds. By the way, state of the art, Mike's got to be on some state of the art testosterone too, because that dude oh, looks yeah, of great. Of course he is. For it's no, there's no USADA testing. Yeah, I don't think so. That's part, probably partially why the fight's also in Texas. But, uh, but yeah. you know, he's going to have a lot of size on Jake. Jake's going to put on weight just because he's going to need to be bigger. I don't know if it's going to be good weight for him. But I think yeah. Jake's best scenario, his best strategy is to hope that he can stay away from Mike for like three or four rounds and hope that Mike gets tired and then he can he can come in and land some shots because Mike still hits harder than Jake could even imagine to hit. So that's going to be the intrigue. But yeah, well, well if, if me and Dave don't do something, then maybe you and me have to do something. Uh, but yeah, we'll figure it out. But next week, come join us. This for the Dave Meltzer Super Chat Q&A. And uh, we'll have Dave on for at least a half an hour, maybe more. And hopefully people come through. And if you've ever had a question in that memory chamber that you've always wanted to ask Dave on the air to get his immediate reaction to your question, this is the day to do it. Next Tuesday. All right. For Andrew, I am Double G. We will see you when we see you. Peace out.